Welcome to day two of the Diana Initiative. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors once again. Um, INEG Learn Security, Exonius, um, Juniper, MongoDB, Corelight, Google. Um, also, we hack Purple and of course, Bridge Crew. We could not do this without you. We thank you all for sponsoring. And please remember to stop by the expo. Um, go go pop in to some of the sponsors, say hi, and see what's going on there. Uh, today, I'm really excited to introduce this talk and this speaker, um, Veronica Schmidt. Um, the the I, I've always been fascinated by the fact that we don't log enough in applications, and uh, I tell my own developers we need more. Veronica's talk today is going to take us down into application logging and more as it affects to um, incident response. So without further ado, I'm going to let Veronica take it away. Hi, everyone. Good evening from a very sunny and bright Norway. Uh, it is the country where the sun never sets in summertime. Who knew? I am very happy to be here today and to present to you my talk. Um, if we do not have it, we should build it. Um, so with that, just short and sweet who I am. I'm an assistant professor at Norfolk University College. I'm a director for incident response in my company in, in the South Africa, as well as an advisement security engineer at a medical device manufacturer. But probably the most important thing is, is that I'm a cyborg. Uh, I have a cardiac device that keeps me um, living and breathing and keeps my broken heart beating. And this is kind of what set me into the world of looking at different applications and devices and understanding what um, they do. Now, incident response is one of those things where we come in and we are, well, let's just say the building's on fire, everyone's panicked, and we are sometimes left with having to make determinations of what happened with little to no logs. Now, just to give you an introduction story is I worked on an incident response in a big enterprise in South Africa where uh, we only had a single source of logs. Um, we didn't have any VPN logs, any firewall logs, any SIEM logs. We literally had the endpoint logs on the devices themselves. These ironically have been cleared at the time and the client looked to me and said, but what happened? Well, somehow we were um, asked to create some very dark art, you know, instant response is part of the dark art that we can manufacture evidence when it doesn't exist. About three years ago, I embarked on a journey with the biohack village at DEFCON and trying to understand how medical devices work, specifically how mine work. And that is how I presented my first talk. But I became obsessed in a way whenever um, there was a press release or something's been published where we said, up until this point, we do not know if any devices have been exploited by this vulnerability or any application in the healthcare and medical sector has been exploited. And I started collecting medical devices that I would hack. I would then go and forensically image them and try and do incident response or dead box forensics to understand what evidence is on there. It became glaringly obvious that logs for security was not a thing. Um, these things had maintenance logs. They had logs that could you know, do, help with debugging. They had everything except what I needed to do incident response. And now the question is, we state that we, up until this point, we're not aware that something has been compromised, but if we do not have the necessary evidence to determine that something's been compromised, we cannot really state that, you know, it's it hasn't been compromised. Because the simple fact of the matter is there's generally not enough evidence or information for us to do a root cause analysis. So after 12 years of always going like, I wish I had this, you know, I wish I had more information in the logs. 
if only we had correlating um, evidence across multiple log sets, we'll be able to reconstruct the timeline. I came up with, you know, we were sat sitting having coffee one day and I'm like, you know, but if nothing goes right, maybe I should go left. And my partner looked at me and said, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I'm thinking like we're always trying to come and solve things at the right hand side of, of development or where applications lie. It's always after the fact. It's always playing catch up. It's always being um, there at the end of when things occur. And it became glaringly obvious that if I wanted to make an impact for future breaches or future investigations, I would need to make logs sexy. I need to make logs a feature. I need to make logs something that we think about right in the beginning versus right at the end, when in retrospective, we look back and realize we don't have enough information. Now, disclaimer for the day, I am absolutely not a developer. If I write code, something will explode. However, I love the processes and how software development works how teams are put together and looking at, you know, solving constraints and problems. I'm a problem solver. It's what incident response and digital forensics do. We want to solve what happened. Now, development is no different. Now, what I realized after about three years working with development, operations, red teaming, blue teaming, all these kind of things is that it's always green versus blue versus red versus purple. Um, it's almost like we have our silos, our little protective bubbles that we don't want to be inclusive and actually have um, others involved. Now, when I started my career, I was solely forensics and incident response. That's all that I did. And I always was, I was fascinated with how red would manage to pry open the window, jump through, and cause all kinds of havoc. And again, I was amazed by how Blue would defend and absolutely kick someone off, right? And then I look at Green, which is something that I you know, got into the last two years, is how are they able to take a concept and make it come to life? You know, it's some kind of voodoo magic. I'm not quite, you know, sure of how exactly this works. But these teams always seem to be at odds, right? Green is there and inevitably they build something that we need. Um, red is there that only has to get through one open window and then green's gonna be in trouble. Blue is the ones that need to keep what green's developed safe. And purple, well, we get to come in when things have gone horribly wrong. And as I sometimes feel like the parent in these relationships where, you know, no one's getting along. But what I learned is to do any one of these teams, we need to understand the different perspective. Developers need to understand how red attacks, how blue defends and what purple needs to know to solve the crime. The same with red needs to understand how an application is put together so that they can find the loophole to get in. They also need to understand how blue defends so that they can actually anticipate what the defense side is going to do. More so, they need to understand what they leave behind because purple will pick up on any trace that is left behind. And this is applicable to all the things. And I realized that the, the point in my career where I explored all of these sections made purple teaming much better for me. I could understand and anticipate how the attackers got in how to get them off, and potentially why it happened and how we can fix it right in the build. So it's almost having this unified or realistic view of all these different disciplines. Now, incident response and logs have quite a unique relationship. I eat them for breakfast, lunch, and suppers, and sometimes even snacks. I think it is the dirty laundry of application development as well as enterprise. If, if, you know, if anything is going to be accidentally leaked, it will be within the logs. Now, as incident responders, we generally come in once the compromise has occurred. Um, we get to investigate what's in the logs. So we want to know the who, what, where, why, and how it happened. Without the logs, we're kind of twiddling our thumbs and not knowing what to do. Uh, we are also the magicians that make findings from whatever we have to work with. However, I hate doing findings when there is not enough information. 
So now I'm sitting with the problem of always having difficult problems to solve without the information to do so. So I start, I decided about a year ago that I was going to infiltrate the world of development. I wanted to understand what the thought process around blogs are. I wanted to get into the psychological factors of how developers think, how I can better communicate with them, and how I can corrupt them to create the logs that I need. This was basically my master plan. I also realized that not all application logs are created equal. So, but I also then, you know, after the year I saw that development and application logs, you know, development with their logs have a different relationship than I have. Right, they want to know when something's gone wrong. So that can they do debugging? Can they handle errors? Can they measure how the application's performing? And can they see that their system is acting favorably? Now, when we look at incident response, I'm going to tell you that development does their own type of incident response as well. I had a conversation with the developer and I said to him, you know what? You and I do the same thing. And he's like, no, we don't. I'm like, but yes, we do. You do field investigations. When something goes wrong, you go back to your logs and you try and find out what the error was. You, you try to debug the problem. Well, I do the same. My incidents are just different. Your incidents are development incidents where something's gone wrong or something's broken, something's misbehaving. Mine is from a security perspective. But incident response is exactly the same as field investigations, just from different perspectives. I soon realized that the way that we look at logs depend on the role that we have. We have different colored lenses, and therefore, we look at them differently. Now, I also realized that statistically, green outmeasures blue, red, and purple. So meaning that if we actually wanted to create change or we wanted to have the biggest impact, we would need to turn developers into forensic coding ninjas. Now, in security and application logs, for security, I want to be able to audit what's happened. Now, audit in terms of security is not like ticking the box and saying things are there. I want to see from authentication, session management, step by step, how the workflow went. I want to be, do, be able to do traceability in it. I want more observability within the log so that I am able to early on detect that something is busy going wrong. I want to know the who, the what, the where, and all of the security things. But these are not the same as what developers want. So again, different perspective, but the same logs. Development wants to know, can they debug? Can they do system checks? Can they look at the integrity of the application, how it performs? Now, currently, application logs are designed by developers for developers because security is, all, is often right on the, at the end and is something that's bolted on. It's not something that's considered throughout. With the developers that I worked with, it became glaringly obvious that the, the process of forensic readiness and system isn't embedded into these teams. And this is where we are failing as security and forensic practitioners. We should be training the guys, you know, passing on the knowledge to those that are building the applications we are set to defend and we are set to do incident response on. Security wants to know the who, where, what, why, and just be able to do breach analysis and early detection. Again, now I'm going to give you the, the, the scoop on how I managed to infiltrate the world of development. And just for the record, this scared the crap out of me because I know nothing about it. But I was willing to sit, listen, and just take in what was going on around me. Now, one of the things that I realized that the developers were talking about that security always enforces is the security controls from the NIST 800. And I also realized that developers wanted to be able to measure things. They wanted to be, be able to see, well, this is where I am, this is the plan where I want to go, and this is what will be a favorable outcome. So for my research, I started looking at these kind of security controls in these categories and started designing a benchmark. I designed a test that they could do unit testings with, that they could integrate into their testing frameworks. 
I also looked at the 20 critical controls because these are things that security cares about, right? We want, and one of the control six says maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs. Now, again, the term audit here is something security is very, very um, familiar with. However, developers don't understand what an audit log is. So I tried to see what was out there in terms of standards so that we can create a benchmark tool. And I, and I use the word tool very loosely because at this point it's an Excel spreadsheet up until the point that I'm confident enough to turn it into a web application. And yes, it scares the crap out of me because I can code to pass logs, but I'm scared of building things. That is an art form in itself. The ASVS from OWASP was another thing that I, that I knew the developers were using to measure the applications with. And it talks a little bit about logging and monitoring and testing logs. And it specifically says that there needs to be a verification that there is a common log format approach is used across the system. This is another thing that glaringly obvious that in an organization, the logs for an applica each application is vastly different because it's designed by different teams. These teams often work in isolation from each other. So meaning that within a big enterprise that does software development and you have six or seven applications, your structure of your log will be vastly different. The contents of the log will be vastly different. Now that has some struggles or difficulties when you have a seam solution that you are hoping to, you know, parse these, you know, ingest into. If you don't have a unified format or a structure or a standard for logs it, across the system, it becomes very difficult for an incident responder to be able to look at the, the broader picture. And one of these things that I've noticed is date and time discrepancies, where the application might be in UTC time, where it gets information from a device that is in local time zone. And there's no reverting it back or indications of the time zone or even just the date and timestamps are format, formatted differently. It's very important for um, actually log analysis to have things structured well, to have your date and timestamps consistent across the system. Now, another thing that the ASVS looks at is whether logs are securely transmitted we need to understand that some of our application logs actually reside on a mobile phone, um, on a local desktop, um, on systems that we do not, do not control, or even on um, cloud solutions that we do not control. And they are sent to a localized server where they are ingested, hopefully. And it has to cross multiple, multiple trust boundaries. So the question needs to be asked, are you actually um, protecting your logs both at rest, transmission? Are you checking the integrity of what you sent within the contents of the log is received by the server is indeed what you received? Do you those do those kind of um, checks? Um, can you tell that when something's occurred or a log's been cleared that you have an indication that that has happened? Often in application logging, these are not considerations that the development team would take. And these are why these standards that are out there are super important to know about. So one of the things that I've also noticed and what the ASVS talks about a lot is not collecting or logging sensitive information. Now, sensitive data disclosure is one of the things that is still super relevant and still something that occurs. From all the teams that we deal with with data breaches, often the information was leaked through the logs and the logs got accessed by an attacker. Now, for a red teamer and doing reverse engineering of an application, one of the first places that we go to for information is logs on the local device is to look at how the application communicates, authenticates, um, whether there's any app keys and secrets. And, you know, in my job, you know, doing log analysis, I have found many app keys and secrets that have accidentally been disclosed within logs. You need to, you also need to know that logs are often not stored for a absolute lifetime and generally as short as possible meaning that the logs that we need to get in, we need to be able to do early detection on. We need to be able to do real-time analysis 
to get to you know identifying a breach faster when logs contain private or sensitive information um, or what these things are you know might depend from country to country some countries um, if your applications cross borders might not want any geolocation information published if it's perhaps in the us phi and pii that might not be able that definition may change so if you are doing application development and you're doing it across borders it becomes absolutely tricky to understand what you may or may not do and just because you have access to the information doesn't mean you should necessarily have it in your logs um, it's one of those things is do you need it for any technical purposes or is there a different way that we can print the same information um, without exposing us now when it comes to organizations um, sensitive information or data in itself has become the target specifically if you even look at ransomware groups they have moved and shifted from just encryption to actually now go into selling the data because data is something that's a commodity that you can constantly sell and get financial remuneration for it's also something organizations don't want leak Now I scratched my head for a little bit and thought to myself, well, so how am I going to do this? Because, you know, I'm going to walk into a development room and I'm going to be the sore thumb sticking out. I'm going to be the girl with the blue hair that is going to scream hacker immediately. Now, a friend of mine gave me these two books and said, you know what? I think you should go read this. I think that this would actually help you understand it. Now, the Unicorn Project and the Phoenix Project is probably what changed my perspective on everything it's an excellent book that i can recommend for any security practitioner you don't have to be in development to read this but if you are engaging with the development team these are the books that you need to read and this is how i formulated my plan i realized that where most development teams were failing were in the five philosophies from the book uh it's it it has this way of framing the dysfunctional family that is operations and development. And I realized that security often comes in, we kick down the door and we say, we found these vulnerabilities and we want you to fix it. I kind of now feel looking back at you like the bully or the one that said, you know, if I had this information, I'd be able to do better incident response. But not once in my 12 years that I think, hey, perhaps I should pass on some of the knowledge. Um, and one of the first ideals in this book was locality and simplicity was, you know, how easy is it to onboard? How easy is it for our developers to work? Um, do we make it hard by going back to them and forcing them to fix things that shouldn't be fixed? You know, do we, are we fair in our assumptions that they build things badly on purpose or do we just not understand how the process works? The second ideal is focus, flow and joy. Um, you know, you have to love what you do and developers love to build. Developers don't necessarily love to defend or to do investigations, but they love to build. It's a puzzle. It's a problem that they solve. The third ideal in the book is improvement of daily work. Um, and the fourth ideal was probably the one that I failed in as an incident responder and I'm quite honest about it is psychological safety is being able to say that I made a mistake in a safe environment without you know, having repercussions or having dire, um, someone losing their jobs. Now, when incident response occurs, one of the things that we have noticed so often is the fact that organizations will go to the development team and say, you've built this wrong, who is responsible, and most likely there will be heads cut and jobs lost which shouldn't be the way because then we are not learning from our mistakes. I'm a big supporter these days to say, well, you made a mistake. Did you learn from it? If you learn from it, cool, let's move on and not do this mistake again. I've invested into that developer by saying, you know what, you made a mistake, but you learned from it. I don't have to invest in someone new that's gonna make the same mistake. The fifth ideal, which is very important for a development team is customer focus. They want to get a product out to the customer. That is the whole purpose of it. That is why they are there. Now, I decided based on these books that I wanted to go on an adventure to build logs with a purpose, right? Logs should be so much more than just an output from the console. 
they need to be built with purpose and with meaning. I know it sounds like a pipe dream, but after a year, I can say that this pipe dream has got the potential, if more developers come on board, to actually become a reality. So I sat and I thought, well, everyone always says, how can I build better lots? So based upon and inspired by Gene Kim and his writings, I actually created the five philosophies for building better logs. Now, philosophy one, uh, keep it simple, structured and detailed enough. And I know this sounds actually so complicated, but it's not. You need to ask yourself within development a few questions. Are my logs only going to be used for debugging? Am I only going to be the one or is it going to play a larger role within the enterprise um, to go into a seam solution? Um, because this plays a role in both the output and the design structure of the logs, right? Because then we're going to have to actively build in early detection, threat intelligence, triggers, warnings, things that are going to go, hey, the application's misbehaving. And sometimes logs can play a large role within a theme to actually find errors that, that could be missed by a developer. Now, you also need to think about this right in the beginning. What is the purpose of the event that you're going to create and monitor? Are they going to be more related to debugging, error handling? Are you going to include security events? Are you going to include things for future forensic incidents or system performance measurements? This is very good to figure out right in the beginning. Often logs are just a byproduct of code. Now, um, Uncle Bob was another person that I found inspiration from. He said the clean code, you know, is a professional thing that developers need to do well i want to go so far as to say that the teams that i've looked at with large projects with the large teams that had sloppy logs often the code was also sloppy but if i looked at the smaller streamlined teams that were like very well planned and very thought out or had many constraints within their logs i realized that their code was very structured very clean and that translated over into the logs so I kind of go and say that clean logs is an indication of clean code. But if you look at logs and they are unstructured and messy and, you know, just print bodies all over the place, it might be a good idea to actually do a critical review of how the code looks. This also, the keep it simple, keep it structure, do not log in more than you should is important when we start passing the information. We want to be able to actually digest and ingest the information. And if it's just a jumbled, unstructured mess that is unable to be regexed or passed or processed, we're wasting our time. Because incident response wants to come look at the pattern. Security wants to build in early indications of a compromise. But even developers need to be kind to their future selves when they have to do debugging six months down the line and they now have to look through the logs. I did a survey and asked developers how much they enjoyed going through the application logs. And shockingly enough, out of five, it was about a 1.25, which leads me to believe that either um, logs are really not sexy and there's something very wrong with me, which I'm not, you know, which I'm not saying is not true. Or logs and applications are such a horrible thing to review that even the developers don't want to do it themselves. Now, philosophy two is keep a tag, create metadata, and use it. So what do I mean with keep a tag? Well, let's look at it this way. Um, when we deal with some data elements or variables that contain PHI, PII, and we're not allowed to log it, What's one of the ways that we can easily redact it? Well, Apple does this quite cool in their logger system is where they actually tag these as PHI, confidential. So another thing that developers need to consider and teams need to consider right in front is privacy. You know, what are the privacy considerations? What variables fall within those, um, those data elements and those privacy levels and how you're going to deal with it? So one of the ways that you can do that is to tag them so that you can, within your code, build in the security controls to not print them in logs, to either salt them, to redact them, to not print them you know, at all, or just find an alternate way to have them in your logs. 
This helps with controlling accidental leakage, you know, accidental information that's printed into logs. You need to be aware right at the beginning the types of data you're recording in your logs and whether you have the right to actually retain and access that. And also consideration needs to be given as to how much access an internal development team would have to be able to access debugging information. I am a big supporter of having a debug level um, log split from the application logs themselves. That the debug logs never go into production, but it is a you know it is a separate log that we can look at. Now, philosophy three is probably one of my favorite ones, and if you cannot tell, I'm an absolute nerd when it comes to Star Wars. Keep it clean and focused. Now there's a trend here. It's all about structure. It's all about you know thinking ahead of time what we need to do. Now, you as a developer, you do different sprints and um, updates to your code and changes, and your application grows. But often, one of the things that's not looked at is logs. Now, your logs grow over time with your application. With changes to what you have done within your code, there might be the introduction of information you're not aware of is in your log. You might also you know, only review your logs once something has gone wrong, much like incident response. We only really look at these things once an incident's occurred. Um, it's never before an incident's occurred, but there's a whole shift in the paradigm of security where we actually want to detect these breaches before they happen. We want to be able to look at them and say, hey, you know what, there's something funky going on. We might need to you know, pull this device or look at portions of code. Now, logging is often also a byproduct of the various features. Uh, so as a new feature is added, there are new information that's included in the logs. Now, technical debt is absolutely a swear word that no one wants to deal with, no one wants to think about. But much of that we have, it's its sister, which is logging debt. If we don't deal with things within our logs, over time it grows and it becomes worse. Now, logging data is a real problem. It's also a real security consideration because that is where you are going to have sensitive data disclosure. There's most likely where you're going to have some information you don't want there. It also means that your logs have turned into a sea of useless information that really doesn't have any value. Now, when I dealt with teams and spoke to them about, you know, how we deal with logging data, they said, but, you know, we have no way to measure how much debt we have accumulated within our logs. With this, I say to them, well, perhaps what we can do is in regular intervals, look at doing this. Now, development teams have sprints every two weeks, three weeks, or however long they, um, they choose to have it. I always say to them, we should be dealing with one bad thing in our logs each sprint. If you find something, deal with it. Um, so what you would do, and specifically with regards to this, is make it like a CTF. Uh, inspire them to go look at what, what's broken or where there's verbosely overlogging, where they could potentially make it better. Um, one of the things that I got asked is, well, how am I going to test where my logs are and how, after I've cleaned them, how I can benchmark them regularly? Now, I have an OWASP project that I am always keen on having more people aboard that does a benchmarking of logs. It takes the security controls from NIST, translates them into security events, as well as taking into consideration things that development might need. You are able to score your logs out of five to develop a percentage of maturity and to identify which components you are overlogging or underlogging. It also gives developers an idea of what they should be logging in terms of security and what kind of events we are looking at. These tests, well, this benchmark is designed to fit in with your unit testings um, and can be part of quality assurance um, in the long run. But the most important thing with dealing with logging debt is to do so with every sprint. Now, philosophy four is probably the most controversial one. It's the one that I get frowns upon more often than none. It's 
Assume that at some point you will suffer a compromise and log accordingly. I always say to my client, it's not about the if, but the when. Everyone gets breached at some point, but the real question is, are you going to firstly be able to detect that you've been breached? Are you even going to be able to do a full incident response process and root cause analysis? Are you going to be able to defend and get actionable information from your logs? Now, this is applicable whether it is sensitive data disclosure or actual unauthorized access. When this happens, the logs are going to be your friend. You're going to want to be having that information stored that you are able to revert back to them. Logs gives us a glance into the past of things that have occurred and the workflow of our application. Um, logs can also be your enemy. If they are unstructured and unreadable and very just difficult to deal with, leaving gaps and holes, it becomes more of an enemy than a friend. So I also, I always ask people, be kind to your future incident responder. We want to see your logs. We want to read your logs, but only if they are readable. So let's look at building logs with, a, you know, actionable information. Now, you know, I always get said, why are you hammering on early detection? Well, if we can see that something's going wrong, we can act appropriately. Generally, it takes very long for us to identify that something's happened. But also another thing that's important is knowing where you're vulnerable. And every application has a vulnerability, has a weakness. We are not at an age where we build the perfect applications with no flaws, no problems, no issues. You need to know what behavior is normal in your environment to be in a position to identify what could be evil. I always say the best people to hack an application are the ones that have designed it. They know where the weaknesses lie. But just because an application has a vulnerability or a weakness or a point where the threat is high, doesn't mean that application needs to be burned and sacrificed. What we need to do is buff up our reporting to support that vulnerability, to get, you know, create observability across it more um, in-depthly. Now, philosophy five, consider who has access to the logs and how they are stored and how they are transported. This is probably one of the things that incident response plays a high role in. I want to know that what I'm looking at is true and not false information. Ultimately, trust no device, no system, and no method of transmission. You need to build your logs with this in mind, almost have a zero trust mentality of knowing that at any time the logs can be tampered with. So we want to know if they've been tampered with. We want to create controls that does that. Uh, we shouldn't be trusting systems or methods of you know, transmission. We can build in controls that these are there, but we need to see that the confirmation is done um, of TLS or you know just data validation. In multiple breaches, there has been an unreasonable amount of trace, trust placed in the fact that the device can be trusted, that the way of transportation can be trusted. But what we found is that within application logs, there's been events that have been overwritten. And often we don't know that it's been overwritten, but the only reason we do is because things the workflow doesn't make logical sense. Now, Windows does a very unique thing. And please, for the record, I am not a Windows baby or Windows fan, but for, for logging, Windows event logs are quite cool. Because Windows interact, you know, the security event log is written to by Alsace.exe, the executable that is in control of it. Whenever a log is cleared or changed, there is an event that's created automatically that tells us that it's happened. Now, something that developers need to understand is we want to build in the load card principle within our logs, meaning that every two things that come into action with each other leaves a trace evidence behind. And yes, in general life, in computer forensics, this happens. But in applications, we need to build in that forensic capabilities. Organizations should also consider all their log data as public. I always say it's not about the if, but the when. And the most important thing is how you're going to deal with it. How do you deal with the breach? And, and I've seen organizations actually feel like they have to um, almost hide it. 
because they get shamed. We should not be shaming developers for making a mistake. We should be showing them how to fix it and we should be enabling them to grow and learn from it. Now, sensitive data disclosure is still part of the OWASP top 10. And 34% of data breaches in 2018 involved an internal actor. And this is why I say consider what information you're, you know, internally you have access to. Logs can be such a great source of information to leak. If you are constantly having information you think no one's going to see until the insider threat occurs and that information is leaked, which causes reputa reputational and financial um, impacts for you. It's also estimated that a business will fall victim to a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. Now, 52% of all the data breaches were caused by cyber criminals, 25% system glitches, and 23% by human error. Now, I can hypothesize that 23% of those human errors most likely were information that either were accidentally disclosed or it was information within logs. Now, the average time to identify a breach in 2020 was 228 days. I ask you, can your application logs indicate within a SIEM solution that you have been breached? Or is it going to be 228 days or as soon as an actor tells you that they were in there? I know these, you know, I would think like we're in the 2021 that the, the stats are going to be looking better. But detection is still something that we are really failing upon. Now, the securing, secure logging benchmark is a good idea to understand exactly where your logs are, specifically when it comes to legacy logs. Now, legacy logs are those that we forgot we had, we never looked at, and there are issues with them. Often, logs can be forgotten, and it can be forgotten what they hold, right? Because we are so focused on building the next application update, getting the next sprint done, getting the next feature out. Um, I always say don't get caught with your pants down and sensitive data leaking through your legacy logs because often in incident response we found legacy systems or legacy code producing log um, log information that just shouldn't be there you need to figure out where you are and figure out where you need to go and you need to do this introspective look at your logs and identify what is broken so you can know what to fix now, I've already spoken about working and dealing with your log data in sprints, where I feel that logging should be a feature. Logging should be dealt with actively every two weeks, whether it is to improve it, whether it's to change it, whether it's to move it over, or whether it's to actually just take out and refactor legacy information. Now, you also can are able to find vulnerabilities within your logs. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that you find JWT tokens or, you know, app keys and secrets? Go into your logs and look at them. Look at them critically. Have security go through your logs. Have your local incident responder go through your logs. A good way to identify sensitive data disclosure with, you know, within your logs is to actually go and read them. Now, one of the biggest things I realized that I'm super excited about is OWASP has a project called Cornucopia. Now, cornucopia is threat modeling for developers done by developers. Now, I said early on that red teaming is, you know, the best red teamers to pen test an application is the ones that have designed it because they have the inside scoop. Now, having um, threat modeling done helps you with your log design because once you've identified potential threat landscapes and areas of higher threat values, you are actually able to log appropriately. Now, OWASP Cornucopia takes um, what is done in Stride, which is still very much used as a threat modeling component, and gamifies it. I'm a big fan of gamification. I have my developers play OWASP Cornucopia, as well as actually to play things like tabletop incident response games. I am known for actually putting them in the security seat and say, hey, this has happened on an application. How do we do incident response? How do we find out what happened, how happened, who was involved and why it happened? It's putting them in the mind frame of saying, OK, I built this. How will I protect it? How will I threat model it? How would I attack, attack it and how would I investigate it? Now, this is a card game specifically meant for teams in the agile environment. I have played this in hybrid situations. But it is also in a language and platform that is actually technology agnostic. But it just 
identifies threat modeling with an inverted stride, not from the attacker's perspective, but how do we build it more better? How do we build um, our applications to be better with authentication, authorization, data validation and encoding and various things? If you want to check this out, go check this out. OWASP has a link. Um, I will also try and find the link for my project. And if you want to get involved, please hit me up. I need more developers to get involved with forensic readiness. I need them to turn into forensic coding ninjas. I want to inspire developers to learn to be purple teamers because they do it best. I also want them to do red teaming. Um, if the only thing you remember from this whole conversation is your log should be simple and structured. They should be, they should only contain enough information without disclosing sensitive data. Often accidental information disclosure will happen within the logs. So accordingly log for future breaches in mind. Here is my contact information if you want to have a chat. There is my OWASP project if you want to get involved. Thank you so much for your time. I had thorough fun um, and I hope that at least one developer thinks a little bit differently about why logging is important. Absolutely awesome. The, thank you so much. I learned quite a bit. Are you going to make your slides available? Definitely. Um, I will put it out there and I will you know, publish it in, on my blog post as well. Um, I really am open to having more conversations about this um, if anyone wants to have a chat. Awesome, awesome. Um, I was just looking through, I didn't see any other questions yet. Anybody, just in case, are there any questions? We have a couple minutes left here. And we'll see if anybody types in. I, I think one of the things that caught me the most, I remember it from 2019, but 2020 being, 228 days to discover uh, an incident in the in you know and figure it out um that's just that's absolutely frightening <laughs> um, no no wonder we're doing so poorly <laughs> well that's the thing right is we are unable to detect early and, and the only reason we're knowing about the ransomware attacks is because they're violent right they yeah. encrypt everything and they stop us from working but if we look at the solar winds and we look at the kaisera and all those kind of things that are now actually going into you know where the binaries are created and infiltrating the pipeline that we are trying to you know where we create our applications we need to have something in our logs that you know give us an indication that this is happening we need to start building in observability. I think it's one of the things I miss the most in logs is I don't have observability into the workflow. Everyone says, but it, it does happen. And I'm like, but it's not in your logs, but I'm implying it's in my logs. If it's not explicitly in your logs, it didn't happen. In a previous company I was at, I also found that they were logging everything. They just had no analysis. And the only time they did analysis of the logs, especially the application logs, was if somebody said, hey, I think we have a problem. So it was always waiting until somebody figured something out. There was nothing else going on. And that just absolutely blew my mind. Anyway, um, I, I really want to thank you again. I didn't see any other questions pop up. Um, I did put the survey out there, everyone, if you could take a few moments and go rate the talk, um, that would be great. That's, that's one of the things that I like to push a little bit because I'm a speaker as well, and I don't think speakers get enough surveys to know how well they're doing. Um, I've seen talks where there's you know 500 people in a room and they'll get 10 surveys filled out for the particular session. So please take a few minutes. It won't take long at all. It's, it's a single form. Um, it would be greatly appreciated for both V and all of our speakers. Thank you so much.